Hello, everyone, and welcome to another amazing UXL Mastermind. One of the things that makes life excellent and phenomenal is having really amazing relationships and how to be in relationships. And so when I met Jeff at the Soulful Affiliate Alliance and uh, conference here a couple, well, three weeks ago now, wow. uh, it was, yeah, it's, yeah, three weeks already. It was uh, an amazing conversation. It's all, uh, Jeff's work is, is really, really a profound work working with men and working with groups and also one-on-one -on -one in, in life coaching. And in just a couple of our calls, was able to unpack an aspect of my reality as a man that <laughs> had me laughing. And then also in deep introspection afterwards, he gave me a couple of books to get to and some homework. So we're gonna have such a good time here today. For the ladies on the call, it's just as relevant as it is for the guys. This is gonna be an amazing call. Jeff is gonna unpack a ton for us. Welcome to our call, Jeff. It's so good to have you here. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you that are watching live and those that will be on the replay and um i was saying a few minutes ago before we began that i'm going to be doing this old school i don't have flashy powerpoint slides um i actually want to be able to interact with you lars and um i never quite got people doing a PowerPoint and just narrating their PowerPoint. So what I want to invite everybody that is on the call right now to do is if you have a pen and a piece of paper, um, I'm going to give you a two part question to take just a couple minutes and write down the first thing that comes to you as an answer. Don't overthink it. Just trust your gut. And <clears throat> one of the other things I'm going to do that's old school is I have some notes that I'll be referring to. So if I look down like that, please know that I'm not disconnecting. I just don't have the memory I used to. <laughs> so here's the part one of this two part question. What is the single most important thing in your life, and I would say about you, because your life is a reflection of you, right? So what's the single most important thing you really, like really want to change? And I should add that you want to change forever. So it's not just something that you'd like to be different next week and get you through the rest of the month. It's what do you want to change for your foreseeable future? Part two is how long have you been wanting that to change? And because Mary just walked back in, hi Mary, you just missed a two-part question that I've invited everybody to jot down a quick answer to. Part one being, what's the single most important thing to you that you want to see be different in your life and in you on a foreseeable future level? And how long have you been wanting that? So that'll all make a lot more sense, everybody, by the time we're done. And if not, Lars can fire me. So let me 
let me tell you all a little bit about me because it's really, really nice that Lars has invited me to be here with all of you. And let me just give you a little background so you know why he invited me besides the fact that, you know, I'm a pleasant person. I have been a coach for 24 years and I, in the last probably 15 or so, my specialty as a coach has been relationships. And I have been in my own relationship for 38 years this year. And so I've learned a few things. And I, if I'm working with people that are not in a relationship, then I'm working with individuals who have already figured out that none of their relationships ever seem to really work out. And they're finally beginning to realize that they're the common denominator and they'd like to do something about that. Then as a side, what used to be kind of a passion project and is now really what I'm putting most of my attention to for growth, and you know, not I haven't given up doing the other coaching, but I'm in the midst of growing a movement that is really for men and for women. If women are with men, for straight women, then if I achieve what we're going for as a community of men, um, things are gonna be really, really different and improved in how men and women interact with each other. Because that's something that, particularly with all of the changes that are happening right now that need to be happening, we're still all human and we all still need to know how to work together and love each other in whatever level. So I've worked with men for the last 20 years to help them, I'm sure this term will make sense, I hope, wake up. Because a lot of us are pretty clueless above and beyond the, I'd say that we're not very well trained or well educated for the most part in how to know ourselves as men and people. And we definitely have been trained for generations that this is how you're supposed to be a man. And this is how you're supposed to be with women. And clearly there's a lot that's been good about that, but there's as much or more that hasn't worked out very well. And so my experience is men and women alike are trying to figure out how do we do this thing called relating with each other. And if you're in a romantic relationship, God help us, how do we navigate that anymore? So that's what I've been spending the last good quarter of my life working on and will be spending the rest of my life working on, I'm pretty sure. So that's a little bit about me professionally. Also, I've written a couple books about relationship that were bestsellers. So I want to talk today about transformation in general. And I'm going to, at times, be sharing about how most of what I'm going to offer you all today is human. It's applicable to humans. And I'm my goal, particularly since it looks like today there are more women on the call than men, um, I want to be able to help women get an understanding that you may not have, and if you do have it, it never hurts to be reminded. Um, and for the men that are on the call and that may be watching this later on, I also want to target a few specific things that men are going to need to deal with, probably more than women might, in terms of the key elements of what it takes to really transform yourself. And if you transform yourself, you're gonna transform your life. 
So I'm going to give you guys four key elements in my life experience, personally and professionally, that I think are really good, solid kind of cornerstones of a foundation for change. And change, I want to be clear, is you really on the other end of it, you barely recognize yourself. You don't, and you kind of dig it. In fact, you should enjoy it a lot. So I'm going to give you the four in a second. And then, because I know that I can get really bored listening to someone yammer on for an hour, um, I want to share some stories that will give you an insight into how I learned these four elements. And, you know, there's lots of subtleties and all that, but because we just have an hour, I want to give you the kind of bigger picture. And then I'll share some of my story about how I really wrestled with each of these. And my hope is that in hearing that, you'll recognize yourself or aspects of yourself and then it ends up being, uh, at the very least, the beginning of a great blueprint for how you get from here to here and how you weather where that gets difficult. Lars, that good? Excellent. And Lars, please feel free to jump in. You know, I've got my notes, but feel free to ask questions. I know the rest of you will have an opportunity for the last half hour, but <clears throat> Lars, you and I can dance with all of this, okay? So this is where you're gonna wanna take notes. Step one is tell the truth to yourself about whether you really want to change or evolve beyond where you are. And when I say tell the truth, everybody, you have to be ruthless with yourself, which is not, in my experience, a generally well-developed human egoic personality strength. I've known a lot of people that can, but I've known more people that even when I say be ruthlessly truthful with yourself, they kind of go, what? So you have to be willing to be absolutely brutally honest with yourself. If, like, if you look at what you wrote in response to my question, and if you, when I ask, how long have you been wanting it to be different? Well then, if that's been more than say a month, for some of you it might be years, then that would be an indicator that you really need to go a little bit deeper into what's really true for you. Because you know what, what might be true is you want to change something because you think you should. And maybe you really don't want to. And with what I know about the ilk of people that I think would be attracted to this mastermind and would be attracted to Lars and what he's up to, most of you probably have a pretty good to great sense of yourself. Otherwise, you all wouldn't be doing the kind of work that you're doing. But I can tell you, as somebody who's been doing this for a long time, I can bullshit myself relentlessly. So you got to start there. Do you really want to change you and your life? And, that, and I would say, do you want that from here? your heart, your spirit, your gut. 
Because anything else, I was watching one of the uh, past masterminds yesterday, and I heard a quote that I really, really loved. Any belief you have that doesn't empower you is inherently false. From David Avocado Wolf. So we lie to ourselves. We have an ego. The ego lies all the time. So that's why I say you really have to feel into that desire. Because if you can't connect with it energetically, you're not going to do it. Step two. Decide where you're going to start. And then once you've decided where you're going to start, which I think should be really, really basic, and again, when I get into my story, this will make, I'll elaborate a bit more on that, but you got to know where you start because if, if you, let's say you want to lose weight, let's say you have a lot of weight to lose. Well, if you say, I'm just going to lose all this weight, there's any number of ways you could do that. So you've got to decide what's the first step. And then from there, you can even begin really drawing out what are going to be some of the, like, what's the sequence that you're imagining and then to be fair, be ready to have it change in a moment's notice. But it's a good place to begin by, I know the goal, I know the objective rather. So what are gonna be the steps that I can follow that are gonna help me achieve the objective? Step three, and this is really, you guys, and, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here because we're here on a mastermind call with coaches, healers, and, you know, wellness people. So I'll just say it because I have to. Get a team around you. I've been blessed to be on the planet a while. And the whole last probably 30 years of my life has been about constant evolution and change and growth. And I never would have gotten there on my own steam. So a team is vital. Coaches, medical people, if that's part of what you're wanting to shift. Um, teachers, masters, spiritual masters, if you have a spiritual path that, you know, is really important to you, um, or masters of achievement and accomplishment that you can learn from, books, talks, workshops, all that kind of stuff. And friends, you really, really need friends that you trust. And I'm going to suggest to you all that one of the, actually, I'm not going to say one of the most important criterion in choosing which friend or friends you're going to have be part of your inner circle to help you win at this evolution that you've chosen for yourself, you have to pick people that won't blink an eye to tell you where you are delusional and full of it. They have got to love you enough that they're going to tell you the unvarnished truth as they see it, you know, Anybody can tell me anything, and I'm a big fan of you've got to go in and, you know, know your own truth. But because we're all capable of deluding ourselves, having people that love you and that you love, and they love you so much that they're going to tell you what they think you really need to be hearing, 
And they're going to put that over whether they're going to upset you or, you know, lose you, any of that. So that's the key thing. Get a team that includes some people like that. And then lastly, you need to commit. And you want to commit every day to doing what needs to be done. This is not about perfection. I'm not advocating perfectionism, but I am saying commit to what you're wanting to change and then keep your word to yourself. Because, you know, this is the thing. When I say to myself that, you know, if I also include friends and colleagues and things, hey, I'm taking on this project, this goal to change my life. Every time I bag it because I don't feel like it or it's hard or any of that kind of stuff, I have basically committed one of the grossest acts of self-abuse that's possible. I haven't kept my word to myself. Now, I do that. I break my word. Everybody is not perfect. We all go off, which parenthetically is why it's a great idea to have a great team that includes accountabilities. Because if I bail on my own commitment, I have people in my life who are going to be on me within 24 hours going, what the hell? What's up? So that can be really useful. So commit to it and take it one day at a time. That's one thing about 12-step programs. I mean, I admire a lot about 12-step programs. But to me, one of the most valuable things about getting sober is really being forced to own that it's a day at a time. Hell, it's a moment at a time near as I can tell. So I'm going to pause for a moment and let everybody breathe. I just want to invite everybody to notice whatever's coming up for you. Feelings, if you're present, if you're finding it hard to stay present, whatever might be true, no bad or wrong answer. I just want you to know this. So I want to share a picture with you. Real quick, hang on. Oh, okay. Let me, so if everybody can see that photo, that is me and my wife and three quarters of one kid and one eighth of the younger one who was about three at that time. So this was me 30 years ago. And at that time I was weighing about 275 or so. So that's the old me. And I'm sitting down, but this is the new me, close to 120 pounds lighter than I was then. <clears throat> and considerably less hair. There's always trade-offs. So I want to tie these four nice elemental steps to real life and kind of just give you a, a quick idea of how each of those really helped me at one point survive, literally survive. Um, so at that age, just a bit after that photo was taken, 
I started my commitment to learning, growing, never stopping. And it all came about because first of a physiological accident that happened that had me bedridden for about a month. And then not long after that, the bedridden period helped me realize that I could not stay that heavy. I also had to come to terms with the cost of it already, you know, and I was in my mid thirties when this first started happening. And at that time I had a lovely corporate career. I was successful in that career, but given that I didn't used to look like that before then, my body was giving me every indication that there was something really off. But I wasn't paying any attention. And if I was noticing, then I could say any number of rationalizations that essentially kept letting me off the hook for either, as my mom used to say, either crap or get off the pot, make a decision. And I kept avoiding that decision. So when you're that young and you're bedridden and you need someone else to help you do some pretty basic things that we take for granted, that began waking me up. And so I decided, so here's step one. I decided that this really had to change. And I was gonna do whatever it took to get it to change. So then I went to step two and I looked at how am I gonna do this? Where am I gonna start? And it was really clear the first place I had to start was I had to begin exercising and I needed to really change the way I was eating. And I'm a really, really finicky, picky eater. I don't like anything that's any good for me. So I had to really, um, let's just say me and veggies have never had a deep, intimate relationship. So... I had to start making those changes and I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do it all by myself. So then I went to step three and I looked at, all right, how am I, how am I going to pull this off? What kind of help do I need? And then that would help me, you know, learn what I didn't know that I didn't know about how step four was going to come into play, which is executing on what. So I built a team around me really fast. Well, you know what? That's not totally true. I built a physical team to help me with the weight. What I didn't count on was that the weight was not the problem. <laughs> the weight, it's really cool to have 30 years down the road to see all this stuff. The weight was a symptom. And I wasn't even going anywhere near what the real root cause was. But I thought I was killing it. And so I got a trainer, I got workout plans, got nutritional advice, blah, blah, blah. And I had to do it one day at a time because it took me about nine or 10 months to lose the first 100 pounds. And any of you that have ever gone through any major challenge, you probably can remember how many times your mind was telling you, oh, this is too hard. 
we're okay, we've made it this far. We don't really need to change anything. So I had to deal with all that and that could be pretty relentless in my case. So then after all that time, I lost the weight, I felt great and I looked pretty good. And then within about three weeks of going back to work, then all of a sudden I started having panic attacks. I've never had panic attacks. And if any of you have ever had one, you know how awful they are. And they would come out of the blue, never a warning. Just boom. And I finally realized after about the fourth or fifth one, ah, something's not right here. I look great, but why am I having all these panic attacks? So that was when I decided that my team was very short staffed because I didn't have anybody on my team that was going to help me figure out what in the hell was going on in here and in here that would have me be able to spend close to 10 years not even really noticing or having a problem that I was beginning to grow and grow and grow, but not the way that was healthy or good for me. I was growing physically. I wasn't growing emotionally. So that was when I started diving in to transformational work. I did every piece of work I could get my hands on. And all four of those steps then ended up being the things that I had to keep doing over and over and over again, depending on where I was developmentally. So I guess that was another thing I would add to kind of maybe step 4B. You got to really get real with the fact that change is a lifetime deal. There's no, there's no there there. So that actually maybe that's part of one where I said be ruthlessly truthful with yourself. Don't expect that there's a mountaintop that you get to and then you're done and you can coast. It's an ongoing thing. So I want to take another pause and Lars, any questions or anything you want to add before I go any further? Well, this is, uh, this is an awesome unpacking of, uh, of a process that really leads to creating huge action. What's going through my mind is how did you figure out that your team was short staff? Like what was that point of actually discovering that for yourself? Like that's a pretty big aha moment. Yeah. It well, the panic attacks were definitely the first indication. And so as they kept going and they would get worse, it wasn't like a flat line level of anxiety or panic. It, it could be all over the map. So I guess maybe the first sign that my team was short staffed was realizing something's happening to me and having to admit I had no idea whatsoever about how I was going to turn it around or even why it was happening. You know, I really, I can, I can remember feeling like, oh, this is happening to me. Victim. <laughs> you know, I, I don't get it. And so that was the first thing and like a lot of men, you know, certainly men of my generation and before, I didn't grow up ever hearing anybody tell me, by the way, when you need some help, it's okay to ask. That was, you know, when I was growing up, that would be a sign of weakness. And 
that is beginning to shift with younger men, but it still can be a thing. I mean, look at the ratio of men to women on this call. You know, so men can be pretty skittish about admitting that they have a problem because then we'd be admitting that we're broken, flawed, or, you know, just screwed up. And male egos can be very, very fragile until they're not. And they can get strong from fragile. It's probably a whole other conversation another time. But that was really when I started, like, it just was as simple as I have a problem. I have no idea why, and I have no idea what to do. So I knew I needed it back then. I didn't have the team label, but I knew I needed to get people helping me that were going to help me figure out what I could and then teach me how to get beyond it. Awesome. Yeah. And then uh, with, with that huge transformation comes the transformation in your own outlook on yourself your relationship with your wife, your relationship at work and things like that. Are you going to get into that kind of stuff? Because that's, that's like a huge part of, of yeah. what's happening here. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, it really did change. And that's another thing I'd say, you know, when we get, when we get perhaps a, a slightly romanticized notion of how cool transformation is, it's friggin' hard. And it takes persistence and resilience and committing and committing, kind of like marriage, actually. So to your point, Lars, the first thing that really began to change was professionally, I could no longer lie to myself that I was a slave to my terror of not having a steady paycheck. I had no idea. I had no spiritual life that I was cognizant of. And I just thought that the main reason for my existence was to try to be a good dude, be a good husband, be a good dad. And, um, you know, hope that I could retire to Florida by the time I got old. So that all changed. So I began to really realize I had to get out of corporate. I had to own that it was killing me. Then it also required me to take a hard look at how I was showing up as a father. And I wasn't okay with what I was seeing. I mean, I wasn't a bad, but it wasn't okay with me that I was a workaholic who put my work ahead of my wife and my kids. In other words, I was turning out to be just like my old man. <sighs> I'm sure everybody can relate to being a teenager and going, I'm never going to do what my mom or dad fill in the blank. I'll never do that to my kids <laughs> or with my wife. And that didn't work out. <laughs> so <clears throat> I started changing my priorities and I started putting my family at a higher priority scale which I think to this day contributes to why we've made it this long and still love each other, respect each other and enjoy each other. I got my priorities straight. At work, I learned a lot of lessons about what it feels like to be going somewhere that pays you for doing certain things that you hate doing. 
I realized that I couldn't keep doing it. That had a ripple effect in my marriage because my wife was acutely aware that I was miserable. And, but she had her own attachments to security. She had a job, she was a teacher back then. But like most people I know, you know, it was impossible to live in Northern California on one salary. So my realizing that I had to follow my spirit scared the living crap out of my life. So I also had to learn how to roll with my first responsibility is to be true to myself with a capital S. So it began eroding some of my attachments and that can get pretty frightening. Then on top of all this, another thing that ended up happening during that whole evolution back then was um, I pretty much still thought everything was up to me. If X was going to change, yes, I had my team, but I have to, you know, it's all up to me to see. And that was kind of dumb on two different levels that I came to awaken to. One being that how hypocritical is it to say, hey, build a team of friends and coaches and all that. And I'm still lone rangering it like a lot of men do. And so you need other perspectives. My perspective was extremely limited. But the other thing I came to learn, and I always want to be sensitive to, you know, realizing that not everybody might think this way, but I realized that I had no connection whatsoever to any spiritual path, spiritual learning, no belief or connection to any kind of higher power, consciousness, universe, Bob, whatever you want to call that higher consciousness. And if anybody even tried to broach it with me, I was like, F off, not interested. Hasn't done anything for me. Jesus. So <clears throat> one day I was in a workshop because I went through a period of being a workshop junkie. And I was in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Shout out to you, Jai. Santa Cruz. Um, I was in a workshop and the facilitator got up in my face, and I mean up in my face. And she said to me, you know, you got to handle this G thing, or you are not going to grow or go anywhere. And my first response, which I did not say out loud, was, fuck you. And I was so pissed. I mean, I was just instantly enraged. And I, I couldn't look at her. And I mean, she was like almost nose to nose with me. And I couldn't look at her. And I turned my head. And we were in this course room that had these big picture windows. And there was this one window that was just a circle. And it had not a, a Christian cross, but you know, dun, dun. but on first glimpse, it was close enough for government work. And I'm noticing that, and I think I must have had a split moment of, oh shit. And then all of a sudden, 
swear to God, I felt like 100,000 volts of electricity shot through my body. That was not in my plan. And that changed my life forever. That was when I felt the connection to, yeah, there's some other power out there. And I really got that that consciousness, that spirit, whatever you want to call it, that it was loving. Because when I was growing up, the church I belonged to back in the day didn't talk about a benevolent God. But this was so clearly what that was, and that it was loving, and that it was kind of in a way, if I look back on it now, it was lovingly grabbing me by the lapels and saying, wake up. How much longer are you going to be pissed at me and rob yourself of knowing why you're here? And that was really the, that moment told me that A, I needed to shift my thinking about, you know, spirituality. And B, I can't do this corporate work anymore. I have to do work to help people. And so that, I kept doing those four steps at the beginning that I mentioned over and over and over. And then at one point, and I think this will be the last highlight of the highlight reel. When my youngest son was 13, he and a good friend of mine who was very into men's work decided that he wanted to have an initiation ceremony where he could be initiated by a group of men into the beginning, obviously at 13, the beginning of manhood. So he spent a year working with my friend and learning about masculine archetypes and learning about manhood, whatever that was gonna mean. And the day came when we did this all day initiation ceremony for him. And, uh, I was a mess by the end of that day. I was so proud of him. And then I had this, you know, another, usually I know that something has to change because I get, I just get <laughs> clubbed upside the head by the universe. And I had this aha moment at the end of that day with him where we had men from 75 to 20 and I realized I never had that when I was growing up. I was raised by a single mom. And I realized, God, I want this. So another habit I developed over the years is if I start feeling like I'm getting too comfortable, I got to change it up. And so I thought, all right, I'm going to stop resisting a men's weekend that a friend of mine had invited me to at least 10 times. No, I don't, I don't need that. Well, I went and I found out I had no idea how much I needed that. And that was another thing that when my life really significantly takes a different direction, it's always these aha moments that I feel from my neck all the way down to my second chakra. It's just like, there's no, there's no equivocation about it. So then I realized, God, I love this stuff. And within a month, I was in a men's group and I was going to these weekends to be staff, staffing weekends. 
getting men that I ran into into those weekends. And so that was also the beginning of what's now, again, a 20 year stint so far helping men. And the passion for that has never left in 20 years. In fact, if anything, maybe because of my age, it's getting to be more and more important. So when you know, like when you can feel down to your bones that you're being called, resist or deny at your own peril. And that takes courage as well as persistence. You know, I always get on these things and I worry that I'm not going to have enough to say. I think that's another thing for me to let go of. One, one thing in the write-up about today's talk, everybody, I had mentioned that um, there would be a blueprint, and I hope I've done a good job today of laying out at least four steps to help get clear what your blueprint is and to then be able to get clarity about who your team needs to be. And then there's just learning to manage your mind because our ego resists change right and left. I haven't really known anybody, unless they're lying, who would say, oh, no, that's not true about me. My ego loves growing and changing and turning my life upside down. <laughs> so one of the, another thing I said that I wanted to talk about was that I would give men that might be on the call a few bullet points about how in my experience of working with a boatload of men over the years, these are pretty reliable, you know, they may not fit for every single guy, but I would bet that every man listening to this will relate to at least a couple of the things. So in no particular order, here are like the top, four things that came to me when I was really looking for what I wanted to share. First thing is you lie to yourself. And you allow your integrity to be conditional. Number two, you probably are in some degree of still actually believing that who you are is what you think and what you do. And that just simply isn't true. Your thoughts, your behavior, your beliefs, they're not who you are. That's why I think it's really useful whether you believe in any kind of spiritual path or you just believe that you have an energy that is wiser and bigger than you that will leave the building just like Elvis when you take your last breath. And in my experience of being with people when they die, that really happens. So a key path for men that I make up, women have a much greater level of willingness and hunger for is to get clear on who you actually are. Third, you have a, a weak connection or no connection at all to your purpose. and or you're not yet clear on how you need to live it if you do know what it is. And, you know, with 
at least one man that I can see. Um, those of us like Jai and I that are, let's say, not 40 anymore, purpose changes. There's a core element of my life purpose that I can look back, literally can look back to childhood and see all the writing was on the wall. The purpose has always been to bring love into greater power in the world. What has changed might be, how do I do that? What's the vehicle or the avenue? And then because I'm so not the man I was even five years ago, you got to be, you know, you got to be willing to bob and weave and do, you know, what your spirit is guiding you to do. So I also know that when I first realized how I needed to live it, I didn't want to do that. That meant giving up my secure every other week paycheck. And ultimately, I've made way more money as a coach than I would have ever made if I'd stayed in corporate. And then lastly, one thing that I think we do as men that shoots ourselves in the foot is we do do that Lone Ranger thing. Any of us guys that are on the call or that are watching this on the replay, how many times has someone you love, let's say your partner, if you're with a partner, um, and they say, how are you doing? And you're feeling terrible. You're bummed, you're depressed, you're anxious, you're scared. And here's what you say, I'm good. I'm fine. good little memory thing around fine, fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. So those are just some initial telltale signs for the men and for women who love men. Because there's probably a decent degree, ladies, that if you're with a man, you have a man that you're romantically partnered with, there's a decent chance he might have an inkling of some of this or he actually knows it really, really clearly. And then he doesn't act on it. So that segues into the last thing I promised was that I would let women who are either in a relationship with a man or are dating and wanting to get into a relationship with a man. I wanted to give a little bonus tip about how you could make that all have a much higher likelihood of success when, whether you're with someone or you get with someone new. And that is, two things. You get a bonus one. First one is how good is he at doing what he says he's going to do? Is he reliable? If you start seeing signs of unreliability and you're getting the, well, I know I said I'd take the garbage out and I got tied up. I'll do it next time and next time never comes, major red flag. Also a good sign that that dude needs a men's group. Because a great men's group, we don't let each other get away with that stuff. We call each other out relentlessly. But here's why the last tip about what to watch out for with men becomes important because if he has trouble keeping his word with himself and with you, with your kids, if you have children, that means that he is turning you 
usually not deliberately, by the way, he's turning you into his mom. So if you're with a man who's relating to you like you're his mommy, run. Or at least insist that he should really look at exploring men's work. Because there's not many women I know that can fully help a man come back into himself because you're not a man. I'm pretty good with women because I was raised by women, but I certainly understand that can I say I can understand every single thing about what a woman goes through? Hell no. So that would be my final tip at 2.01 my time. Here we are. Thank you very much, everybody, for your attention for mm. this hour. Loving it. I love your blunt honesty, man. Every conversation we have is just so good. Yeah, there's, there are a couple of cool things to unpack. Are there any questions from anyone before I start riffing? Because I've got some things I want to talk about <laughs> as a man. <laughs> so are there, are there any questions from anybody? before we jump in. One of the things that I wanted to unpack a little bit because it was uh, very interesting, one of the books that you had me listen to read was No More Mr. Nice Guy <laughs> or something, no, something like that. He's like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So very interesting unpacking conditional integrity. Yeah. I'd love to unpack that. Yeah, well, so I'll, I'll speak for myself how how I have lived that. So just a, a one minute summary of that book is there are a lot of men, and I mean a lot of men out there who were maybe raised by really, really domineering mothers or maybe mom was not emotionally connected and dad wasn't far behind on the emotional disconnect. And so core childhood needs that every human has don't, doesn't get met. We spend X amount of our life until we do enough inner work to get something. And so we look to if you're straight we look to women to try to get in relationship with and by the way ladies we don't usually we're not aware of this this is just patterns that kick in and so we'll tend to put a woman's needs ahead of our own we'll deal with our integrity in whatever way creates the least likelihood of upsetting our women, hurting them, hurting their feelings. And the whole time we're doing this, we're often giving, giving a lot. And we're not really aware that there's a big degree to which we're giving to get something from you. It's not very conscious and mostly not malevolent, but it's, well, if I am, you know, great about folding the laundry for you, and if I see every chore that you do and I just kick in and do it for you, you're going to know I am the most awesome man you've ever met. And then you're going to love me, you're going to want to have sex with me, whatever it might be. And I did that for years. I'm a recovering nice guy. <clears throat> I think Lars is a new inductee into the recovering nice guy class. And so conditional integrity simply means, Lars, that I will define integrity and hold to it in whatever way works for me to either stay comfortable 
not have to hurt in myself or hurt someone else, which of course is total bullshit because when we do that, we are hurting the people we love. So that's how I would look at it. it I can play fast and loose with my integrity. A, a perfect example, when I weighed all that, when I had all that weight on me, I became a diabetic. And I could actually look at myself in the mirror, having a mother who had diabetes and lost a foot, having an uncle who died of diabetes, I could look at my big ass in the mirror and go, there's no problem here. While I'm eating ice cream and cookies and cake and essentially killing myself. That is an example of conditional integrity. I'll get, I used to say, I, I'm going to get healthy. Eating all the wrong stuff. Did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm a I'm a recovering nice guy. <laughs> There's it, man. It it is. It's pretty much in my face for the last uh, what almost three four weeks here since I've gotten started, and you just start to realize. Yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff that um, you know, uh, what you said about like really. My mom had to be really tough growing, uh, raising kids in a in a tribal environment, no running water, no electricity, no friends, no help, no hospital around. So it was like, you know, that stuff going on, and then I realized. I went, you know, out of my way to to make her happy, to make other people happy and make relationships happy and so forth. So my whole persona actually became about uh, really wanting to make people happy. So, um, right. yeah. So let's unpack a little bit. Oh, I want to I want to keep on going. So <laughs> the audience here, folks, team, any questions, any insights, anything that you'd like to unpack a little bit? No, you're just sitting back waiting for me to <laughs> dive on in. Yep. <laughs> All, All right. right. Okay. So we we actually got into uh, the way of the superior man, which I have mm -hmm. a really transformational book for me a long time ago, uh, well over ten years ago. Does that work into your work with men, like that whole uh, process? Maybe we can unpack that for folks that don't know about that book because I think it's mm -hmm. a book. I've Every man should read. I think it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I have, there's at least three core books that a any man should read, in my opinion. And, and in, our, in our men's organization, all of our men end up reading and working with these three books. So... Uh, no More Mr. Nice Guy is one of them because for whatever reason, um, we tend to attract a lot of nice guys. Um, another one is what Lars was just mentioning, The Way of the Superior Man. And that is by a guy named David Data, D-E-I-D-A. And... That book was really one of the first wake-up calls I got. Um, and I want to say the book is 20, 25 years old now. And David's still out there teaching and all that. But it, it really was the book that, to my knowledge, introduced the whole concept and importance of polarity a polarity between masculine energy and feminine energy. And, you know, when I first read that book, I was probably already 25 years into my marriage. And it was so illuminating. I don't agree with everything he says, um, but probably 80% of it is just really, really valuable. And so learning about, number one, what's the masculine and the feminine. And back then in the day, I didn't realize I was conflating masculinity with gender. 
So he was the one that introduced me to the fact that men and women have both energies. Susan, no more Mr. Nice Guy. The way of the superior man is the one I was just talking about. So he gives great tips for, you know, what it takes to be, in his definitions, a great man, a really highly functioning man. And he also is very, very big, one of the first semi-mainstream people to really be making the connection to sacred sexuality in our country. I mean, Tantra has been around forever, but he used to open his weekend saying, welcome to the weekend. I'm gonna teach you all how to fuck your way to God. Got everybody's attention right quick. So that <laughs> remains a really, really good book for kind of helping men develop some yardsticks that, you know, they have to tune to their authenticity. But, um, you know, if you want a woman to trust you, if a cockroach comes into your living room, you don't want to be the dude that gets up on the couch and says, honey, kill it. <laughs> You're not going to feel safe with your man if you got that kind of man. Then the third book that we use is um, called King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. And that is a great book about four key masculine archetypes that all men have. And where it comes in handy is We've used it, I've done workshops around that, helping men see where they're out of balance in their mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual life. And they're great tools for a man to be able to really get a stark look at how much is he living his life from survival versus how much is he living his life because he'd rather die than not fulfill on his purpose. And then we also tend to use the power of now a lot by Eckhart Tolle. Because one of the things about transformation of any kind is you have to really know the difference between your ego and you. And this shows up in my relationship work when I'm working with couples. Um, managing our mind is probably the most important skill we could develop. Otherwise, it will just lead you on wild goose chases in the perpetuity, if my experience is any indication to that and for that one. Yeah, that's awesome. It gives us gives us some homework to do. Mm -hmm. Sure, the guys. I I found that the way of the superior warrior, that one in particular, was really valuable to have like discussions. So both both people in the in the uh, in the relationship or for women. Um, what I would say is if you're looking for someone to date or if you're dating someone or if you're in, in relationship, you start to see it unpacks layers of masculinity and femininity and also the layers of uh, the progression into that divine masculine uh, from the baseline and Jeff jump in here anytime mm -hmm. this is my memory, uh, the baseline of what men think that the masculinity is the physical body, the, um, the job, the provision, whatever that yeah. definition is, right? And then yeah. it goes from there. Maybe take us through that because that would be really cool just to unpack those layers a little bit. Yeah. The Well, you're also making me think about one other important thing, which is, you know, if 
I'm a big fan of recommending that women read Way of the Superior Man. Um, either to understand the man you're with that you might be somewhat frustrated by. And if you're reading it and going, oh my God, I would love a guy like that. That can be an entry point for you encouraging your man to consider being in a men's group. Or if he's already in a men's group, but he's not talking about it much. Every men's group has a rule of confidentiality. So you can never ask your man who's in a group to share anything about what happens in the meeting. But every man in any of my groups over the last 20 years is encouraged to share with his wife or girlfriend, what are you learning? And so with Way of the Superior Man, I think that can be a great book for helping any woman get clearer about what she's really wanting from a man, whether you're with one or in between. Um, no more Mr. Nice Guy. If someone, you know, what, what we tell the men in our community that are reading that book, that are in a relationship, is don't have your wife read the book. And I'm gonna answer your question about way of the superior man all in one shot. We say, don't have your wife read the book because four out of five women that are told that either get in touch with me or they say to their partner, oh, great, here's a book that's gonna teach you how to be more of an asshole. Pardon my French. When we say, don't have your partner read the book live the transformation that the book is pointing you to because that's going to matter the most. Going back to my earlier comment about ladies, if you're with a guy who's flaky with his word and doesn't keep his agreements, he's probably a nice guy and you should be leery. May not be a complete deal killer right out the gate, but it certainly is something that needs to be talked about, you know, very forthrightly. So what you were saying, Lars, is that my experience is that my integrity is the most important thing that my wife can rely on. The masculine is all about providing protecting this goes back you know evolutionary biology this goes back millions of years we still have that in us and the feminine is beautiful and not particularly linear chaotic and you know if you if you only had masculine man, you would be getting crap done right and left and you'd be completely a desert internally. You'd be dry. You'd be in your head. Men are in our heads a lot. It's part of the way that book is so great because it's saying, get out of your head. Um, and then if we are clear about what we want and we know why we're here and we don't compromise our purpose and our vision for anybody including our women that is going to have a profound impact on the level of trust and emotional safety that can be available in that relationship with a possible exception of if you're a woman that really wants to control a man or you're not particularly connected to your own feminine, when you have a nice guy as a partner, then the women end up being the masculine. They bring that masculine thing. I had a conversation with a woman last night who 
heard about me and wanted to talk to me about me working with her and her husband. And what was one of her complaints? I have to do everything. I'm the one looking for the therapist. I'm the one who called you. I'm the one who arranges the field trips and da 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 da. He just goes to work and comes home and lets me do everything. Nice guy. In action. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> what I found interesting about getting into that book is that there, are, there, there's almost like a split personality within me. There was like the, there was the aspects of what I was discovering about my whole history with relationships and things like that. And then there was the other side where I was taking big action, all that sort of stuff in, in life. So having read, uh, been through David Data's book, which I'm now going to swallow up again and go all the way back through it, is that alignment with the, the uh, male, female. And that's actually what I've seen also in, even in business relationships, in seeing oh, yeah. women who are very, very good in business, they actually have taken on a very, very masculine role, like really left brain, get the job done step by step by step, like getting into it. And then uh, one thing that I found very interesting was the aspect of um, the, you know, uh, a lady that can be at work and be very masculine there and then have to switch that off to be the feminine. And then the man also the other side. So that's what creates the polarity and also the attraction. Right. Yeah. So, that, that to me was just totally, totally fascinating. You know, so if, if both read the book and you both into it, then you understand, oh, like my wife's in, in the masculine right now. And that's why there's no sexual polarity going on here. It's like right. there's, there's that energy on a, on a literally on a, on a uh, inner unconscious level almost, right? Well, yeah, it's, it's energy. I mean, everything's energy. Yeah. <laughs> but that... Those are distinct energies. And one thing Dana says in that book, and I, and I want to share something that Mars put in the chat that is right on. We have to have polarity. And it can actually be totally fine if you have a predominantly feminine-oriented man, if you naturally orient more towards your masculine as a woman. It, you know, and if I look at my wife and I, we trade off different times, different circumstances. I might be really in my feminine and she's very in her masculine and flip. So it isn't specific to gender as much as he's pointing out. You got to have both because masculine man and masculine woman are not going to work any more than a feminine woman and a feminine man are going to work. Not a whole lot of heat that ends up happening in the bedroom when you're in either one of those things. And it isn't just about sex. It's also about effectiveness in life. And Mars put a note in the chat. Data has written several books. And, and he does have YouTube videos out there still. Um, he's just been putting out some new ones since he's launching a new training. But... Um, two of my favorite other David Data books, and they're old, but they still, I think, have some relevance. One is called Dear Lover, A Woman's Owner's Manual to Men. I will say that I think a lot of what he put in there is outdated given our current culture. But there's some gold in it. Another book of his that has held up really, really well is called Intimate Communion. Bye, Cassie. Glad that we had you here. So Intimate Communion is a book that I will almost always have a couple that I'm working with read. Wow, awesome. We're at the end of our time here, Jeff. 
It's been, we are. It's been a path of amazing discussion going on between you and me. Yeah. <laughs> no one else really jumped in and was like, yeah, get into it. However, uh, I'd love to know more about your men's work. You are creating a movement. You do men's groups. You do one-on-one. -on -one, you do couple coaching. Let's yeah. unpack that a little bit so folks know how to follow up with you. Sure. So with relationship work, whether that's couples or individual, um, my website for that is yourrelationshiparchitect.com. And for the men's work, and one thing I want to be sure everybody knows, we have virtual men's groups. We have live groups in Denver and Boulder. I live in Colorado. But we also have virtual groups with men all over the world that are available when you, a man might live in an area without that. So theevolvingman.com is our website for men's work. So we have groups and we also, I and my business partner, and that's why I keep saying we, um, we do one-on-one -on -one coaching with men too that are really wanting to overhaul their life, but they're not comfortable being in a group. So Jeff, G-E-O-F-F, -F, at The Evolving Man. Um, please feel free to email me questions if you were kind of shy about asking any here, but you would like to ask them of me privately. Email me there, G-E-O-F-F -F at TheEvolvingMan.com. Fantastic. Jeff, thank you so much for taking time out of your day for us. Really appreciate it. Uh, let's thank close with some closing thoughts for us. Any, any gifts in parting? Hmm. It takes way more energy to not be you than it does to be authentically you. So keep choosing the one that takes less energy. And to do that, you have to be willing to deal with pain. So don't run from your pain. That will grow you more than anything. That would be mine. Thank you. That was a beautiful way to finish our call today. Yeah. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Jeff. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank, thank you so much, Lars, for inviting me to be with this cool community. Yes, I look forward to future discussions. We have lots to sure We'll be having them. There's lots. <laughs> right on. Thank you, everyone. Have an amazing day. We look forward to seeing you on the next call and inside of our group chat. If you have any questions, email Jeff. For those of you watching the replay, all the information is down below, including the book links. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Awesome. See ya. Bye.